Hello there. Welcome to our Wednesday premieres. This is a moment of prayer and the sharing of the word, where the word of God is shared with clarity and with power. And of course, just before we get into the sharing of the word, I would just like you to join us for a few minutes of prayer. So, to begin with, we're just going to turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 from verse 3. Philippians chapter 1 from verse 3. Now the Bible says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. And verse 5 says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now the word fellowship there also means partnership. The seventh verse says, being confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He who began the good work in you will perfect it. He who started will finish it. I want us to just pray that we will have the confidence that the work that God has started in us, he will complete it, he will perform it. You know, sometimes you start a project and along the line, you start to wonder if you'll be able to take it to the very end. And this moment, I just want us to pray that we will be conscious that the good work that the Lord has begun in us, he will perform it, he will perfect it unto the very end. We're praying in Jesus' name. And to Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray for everyone here right now, everyone watching. I pray that there will be a resting confidence. Lord, that you are able to perfect that which you started. Lord, I ask that we will walk with the confidence that the good work which you have begun in us, you will bring it to perfection. Lord, you haven't brought us this far to leave us halfway. You haven't brought us this far to let us go. And so, Father, I pray that nothing will be able to steal and to take away the assurance in our hearts that you are with us and that you will perfect the work that you have begun in us. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray again, just very quickly, as we turn our Bibles to the book of Philemon. Now we are praying the scriptures, okay? So we pray forth the scriptures. So if you have your Bible, just turn, flip over to the book of Philemon. It has just one chapter. We're going to read from the fifth verse. Now, Paul says, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. He says that as you, as you remember all the good things that you have in Christ Jesus, that you will be confident to share your faith. You will be confident to communicate your faith, to share. I want us to pray in this moment that we will have the confidence to share the faith that is in us, to share of the good works of the Lord Jesus towards us, that when we look back and see all that our Heavenly Father has done, and is doing, we will have the confidence to testify, to share our faith. You know, so many Christians get to the point where they are unable to evangelize because they are unable to see the working of the gospel in their lives. So for example, if you're suffering sickness, you will find it difficult to tell other people that God is able to heal you. You see, so the whole point here Paul is saying is, as you see the work of the gospel in your life, let you have the confidence, all right, that you have the confidence to share your faith. He says that your, the sharing of your faith will be effective, okay, because of that which you will see in your life. So there are two things he's saying here. He's, the first thing he's saying is that you will see the effect of God's word in your life. And he then says, as a result, you will share your faith. So join me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I see the effect of the gospel in my life and my confidence to share my faith is steadfast. In the mighty name of Jesus, we're praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone watching right now. Lord, I pray that they will see 
the effect of the gospel in their lives, in every area of their lives, that the word of God will work for them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that as they put the word of God to practice, they will see results. And as a result of this, by reason of this, they will be confident to share their faith. Lord, we will be confident to share our faith in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, that nothing will stop us from the sharing and the communication of our faith. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go share your faith. You know, as you see the working of God, you see the working of his word in your life, be confident to go share your faith. Okay? Again, just turn your Bibles back to the book of Philippians. This time around the fourth chapter. Chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We'll read from the seed verse. The seed verse. Philippians chapter 4. Starting from verse 6. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, I'll just read for you. The Bible says, Be careful for nothing. Some version says, Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Okay? So, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He says, Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. But in anything, through prayer and supplication, let the Lord know your request. Hallelujah. Now he goes ahead in verse 7 to say, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God will keep your hearts and minds. Then that peace will lead you to verse 8, where he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. He says, how do you avoid anxiety? He says, think on these things. So he gives you, first of all, the spiritual principle. He says, don't be anxious. Just let your father know in prayer and supplication. Let your heavenly father know. Then he goes ahead to say, think on these things. I want us to pray right now that our minds will learn to be still. Even as we stay our minds on that which is good, that which is praiseworthy, that which is true. For example, the word of God. The Bible says in Isaiah 20, 20, um, 6 verse 3, the Bible says, He will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. You see, so there is a principle of if your mind is stayed on the word of God, on that which is good, then you will experience the peace of God. And so I want us to pray this moment. Father, just fill us with peace, even as our minds are stayed and steadfast on you. In the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, this moment I pray, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, that our minds and hearts will be stayed on and focused on the word of God, on that which is true, that which is pure, that which is praiseworthy, of good report, that which is wholesome, and Lord, as a reason of this, we will experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Peace of God incomprehensible. Peace of God that cannot be explained. Lord, I pray that as we give our minds, O oh God, to the things that are, that are just and true, Lord, our peace will be steadfast. Our peace, Lord, will be, will be present, will be evident in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, I always say that when our imagination is sanctified, then encounters are multiplied. And I feel like we are faced with a generation where there's so much toxic content being distributed and aired online. And by reason of that, so many people struggling, so many people struggling with anxiety, with worry. A lot of that anxiety comes from the things that your mind is stayed on. And so I pray for you in the name of Jesus that your mind will not be stayed on things that are not wholesome, but you will drift your attention and stay your mind on the word in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn quickly to Romans chapter 12. Chapter 12. And we're going to read verse 12. Okay. Romans chapter 12. 
We're going to read verse 12. Praise the Lord. You see, God is so intentional that he gave us his word. And his word is meant to guide us. The Bible says that we have received all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You see, God has given us everything. The moment you understand that everything that we need has been given to us through the word of God, and then our responsibility is to bring it forth. That's why the Bible says, work out your salvation. The moment you understand this, your life changes. The moment you understand this, your confidence is renewed. Hallelujah. Now, Romans chapter 12 and verse 12, the Bible says, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and steadfast in prayer. My God, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation and steadfast in prayer. Rejoice. Rejoice in hope, patient. Listen, he says, first rejoice when there's hope. You see, where do we get our hope from? Our hope comes from the word of the Lord. You see, our hope comes from the word of the Lord. When God says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, that brings hope. When God says, ye have overcome the world, little children. You see, that is hope. That is hope. He says, you have overcome the world. The moment you know this, then he says, rejoice. If he says rejoice in hope, then it means rejoice in the word. Rejoice in the word, in the promise of the word. Hallelujah. Then he says, be patient in tribulation. He says, when you have trying times, he says, be patient. Because the word of God that you have rejoiced about, that you have proclaimed, is coming to pass, is working. So he says, be patient. Patience is joyful expectation for an outcome, for, for an expected outcome. Be patient in tribulation and be steadfast in prayer. So rejoicing, patience, and prayer. These are three things that will keep you through some trying times. He says joy, patience, prayer. He's given you a formula. Hallelujah. Father, fill my heart with joy. Fill my heart with joy. Teach me to be patient and still and grant that I be consistent in prayer. Come on, come on, lift your voice and just begin to pray. Turn that into a prayer in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that my joy will be full. My joy will be complete. Lord, that in every circumstance, I will be full of joy. I will rejoice in hope, rejoice in the word, rejoice in the promise of a glorious future. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And Lord, I pray that I'll be patient in tribulation. Lord, that when the times are trying, Lord, when the tides seem to come against me, Lord, I pray that I'll be patient and then steadfast in prayer. Lord, that I will not cease to communicate with you, to, to, to tap into the heavenly realms. Lord, to attune my spirit to the Father's voice in prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen, 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 amen. Now we're going to read um, one last verse. As we conclude this prayer segment, turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter, chapter 4. Colossians, chapter 4. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to read from verse 2 downward. Colossians 4, we're going to read from verse 2. He says, now this is like a continuation of the previous verse. He says in verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So he says, you rejoice, you're patient, you pray, and you give thanks. So thanks is a kind of rejoicing. He says, it's a cycle. He says, if you want to make progress, he says, rejoice, be patient, be steadfast in prayer. He says, then now give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. When, you know, I told you last time that when Jesus saw the, the crowd after he had taught them, he turned and asked his disciples, what are we going to feed them with? They said, Master, even if we had a year's wages, we cannot take care of them. Then he says, what do you have? The Bible says he took the little and he gave thanks. What is that thing that you have that you're not giving thanks about? The Father says, give thanks. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the living God. Now, the third verse says, that's Colossians 4 verse 3. He says, without Pray also for us. Now, Paul is telling the guys that, uh, you know, through his letter, he's saying, pray for us. 
pray for us. Those of us who are ministers, he says, pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. He says, verse 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He says, pray that doors will be opened that will preach the word. Pray that I be given utterance in the name of Jesus. Now, I want you to just pray for us right now as a ministry. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for for me as your pastor, just pray that God will open doors for his word to be preached. Even as we are putting these messages out there on the internet, pray that so many people, several people will, will watch these and their lives will never be the same again. That God will open a door, that God will open a door for the preaching of the gospel and give us utterance in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your voice, lift your voice and just pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that you open a great door for the word of God to be preached. God, open a great door. Lord, I pray that you open the doors of nations, the doors of, of, of cities. Open the doors of the hearts of men. Lord, that our message will be preached throughout the world. The message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, of his resurrection, of his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. God, I pray that you will give us an opportunity to present the fatherhood of God, your fatherhood to the nations. Lord, that utterance be given unto us, that we will speak boldly and fearlessly. And Lord, that as these doors open, Lord, we will seize every opportunity. We will make the most of every opportunity to preach the word of God in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus I pray amen and amen and so Lord I just want to pray and thank you for this moment of prayer your word says and I believe that if we pray and we believe that you have heard us then we already have that which we asked for God so we know that you have given unto us utterance oh thank you Lord thank you Lord in the name of Jesus and Heavenly Father, even as we share the word this night, I just pray that every heart will be opened. And I pray that we will be still. I pray that the gospel will be communicated with us with clarity, with excellence. God, teach us that great shall be our peace. Heavenly Father, teach us in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Once again, welcome to our Wednesday premieres. This is a moment of prayer and the teaching of the word. And we have been in a series called Legacy. And um, we have gone from, you know, living an intentional life to the burden of legacy. And last week, we started the, the conclusion of the series with the title, Creating a Glorious Future. So we did the first part last week. And this week, we're going to conclude the that, that, that part of the series called Creating a Glorious Future with the second part, even as we conclude the series of Legacy today. So last week, as we spoke about creating a glorious future, we spoke about some very beautiful things. And if you haven't watched that message, please, the message is on YouTube, the message is online, make sure you watch that message. And I can assure you, your life will never be the same again. And three concepts we shared last week. We said the first thing is the principle of vision. If you're going to create a glorious future, you need vision. All right? You need vision. The second thing, as the Holy Spirit taught us, was words. You see, you create a glorious future with words. You speak words to the future. Hallelujah. And the third thing is following, obedience, following mentors, following God's word. All right? So go back and listen to that message. And I explained last week that those first three points were a spiritual foundation for these next ones I'm going to share today. All right? So stay tuned with me and your life will never be the same again. So how to create a glorious future? Point four, we create a glorious future by investing. Now, this word sounds like something you know. Very simply, to invest means to do something now that yields a greater return in the future or that is expected to yield a greater return in the future. So in the 
nearer future or in a distant future. That's what it means to invest. So if you hear somebody saying they're investing, it means they're doing something now. There's an input in the now that causes a ripple effect in the future. You cannot create a glorious future if you don't invest. Now, I want to give you a number of things that you must invest in because the word invest is largely a, a broad word. There are so many things you can invest in. There are so many kinds of investment, but I want to give you a number of investments to consider when we say invest for a glorious future. Number one, invest in giving, in giving. Now the Bible says some people give freely and grow richer while others hold back and yet get poorer. Now, it is impossible, I say it again, and I say it boldly, it is impossible to have a glorious future if you're not one who invests in the now. Number one, you must be a giver. I want to show you just one or two verses that buttress this point. Now, we have a whole series of giving, and we've talked about giving. There are different kinds of giving, right? Giving to the Lord, giving alms, um, giving in church, giving for the gospel to be preached, give. Paul says, I thank my God for your partnership with the gospel. You have to be a giver. He prayed for them later. He said, and my God shall supply all your need. You cannot experience a glorious future if you're not an investor, if you're not a giver. So give. We have taught about this. He says, honor the Lord with your first fruits with your tithes and offering and see if I will not open a window of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not have room enough to keep. You see, there are so many kinds of, of you know, giving, but I just want to focus on giving in general because I'm sure you know about this, right? Now, the first verse, turn over with me to the book of Psalms. Hallelujah. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. We're going to read verse 5 and verse 6. Okay? Now, verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Yeah. Now, they that sow, they that plant. Now, of course, he's talking about, you know, investing in general. Sowing, planting. Okay, whether it's investing your seed in the ground in the terms of agriculture or investing. But I, I want to draw the spiritual principle of giving from here. He says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. In other words, if you are in a season of hardship, God is saying, sow. If you're going to go from hardship to joy, to rejoicing, God is saying, sow. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Then the seed verse he says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He says, if you're mourning and you carry precious seed, in a season of downness, if what you're doing is looking for what is precious to you to give, he says you will doubtless, he says there is no doubt, you will return with rejoicing. You will return with rejoicing. Look, there's only one fate for a giver. There's only one outcome for a giver. It is a glorious future. That's the only outcome for a giver. A giver, the Bible says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, God is using that principle to say, the one who gives will experience more because more will come back to him. See, if God has blessed you, he expects you to move that blessing by giving to others. Giving will cause the blessing of the Lord upon your life to multiply. You know, so many people argue with this. They say, oh, you know, don't give. Don't give. Why should you give? Listen, there's only one outcome. Are you a child of God? Are you born again? Do you believe in the word of God as infallible and the truth of your, your, your father in heaven? Then you have to understand that giving is an indelible principle for growth. Give. Let's see another verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay. Chapter 9. Read verse 6. He says, 
But this I say. Oh, that's Paul talking. He says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, what does that mean? He says, if you're holding back in your giving, your harvest, the return will also be small. So if you give small, you have a small. Hallelujah. Look, great investors know this, even in business. They know that there's a degree of business and commerce where when you invest a lot. Now, let me just show you just in commerce. Let me just show you how that works. Let's say on every $1,000, you gain $100. Now, if you put in $1,000, you get $100. That's barely much. That's quite little. But now if you put in a billion dollars, Ah. Now, what you put in makes more sense. What you receive also will be tremendous. You must think in that same way when it comes to giving. Giving for the sake of the gospel. Giving to other people. Giving alms. You know, giving your tithe and your offering. Giving to the house of the Lord. Partnering with the gospel. Partnering with things that cause the gospel to spread. See, God says that he who gives sparingly will reap sparingly. He who gives little will reap, will reap little. But he who gives bountifully, it means the one who gives much who have as much. I'm a giver. I'm a giver. You see, David said, I refuse to give to the Lord what does not cost me. I'm a giver. Now, another kind of investment, and I'm sure you know this one, is invest in business or commerce invest in trade look there is no glorious future for you if you're not investing in trade if you're not investing in some form of commerce look practically speaking there are so many things you can do you can start a business you can invest in real estate that's a kind of commerce you can invest in stocks you can invest in so many things okay and you know, the thing I want you to know here is that if you're not business savvy, educate yourself. You need an education to know how to invest in commerce, where to put your money, how to know if this is the right place to put your money. When God gives you a blessing, he expects you to multiply it. Okay? There is nobody who got wealthy just, you know, without investing in one way or the other so if they're not investing in giving they're investing in commerce or business it's a different kinds of investments okay um the bible says in in luke chapter 9 i think verse 13 jesus says occupy till i come some versions say do business till i come trade you see commerce or business investing in commerce or business will cause a wealth transfer Wealth transfer is not some confession that we do in church. I, I declare that the wealth of the heathen comes to me. Yes, that's a good prayer. But beyond that, God is always going to ask you, what do you have? Go study the life of Jacob. See how he traded. Jacob understood commerce. I'm not going to talk about him. Okay. Now, the next kind of investment is invest in generosity or service okay invest in service let me show you ecclesiastes chapter 11 invest in service so serve other people generously okay now ecclesiastes chapter 11 hallelujah we're going to read from verse 1 and the Bible says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Now, to cast your bread upon the waters means to do good to others without expecting anything. You see, just cast your bread upon the waters. Do good. Serve people. Serve in the house of God. Do things for people. Listen, 
one of the ways I've seen people change their lives, I mean, practically speaking, I've seen people who came from the village who started to serve, you know, maybe a, a businessman, they worked for him, they served him, and I've seen how that changed their life. Now, there are certain tribes in the world where this is kind of a culture. So when you, when, 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 you know, one of the people in, in the tribe gets wealthy, other young men will come serve with him. And after some time, he will give them you know, um, some kind of business capital. So serve people, serve people through apprenticeship. Serve, serve. Listen, volunteer. There's no way you will get wealthy if you don't think as a person of service. If you don't think service, I've seen people practically change their lives through service. So generous service selfless service look he says in the second verse of chapter 11 ecclesiastes 11 verse 2 he says give a portion to seven and also to eight for thou knowest knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth he says you never know what's about to come so go and serve so in other words he said one way to secure your future is through service at every moment of your life there's someone you can serve if you're looking for a job, go volunteer somewhere. You will learn skills. You will be given opportunities. You will grow. Don't stay at home and cry and say, Lord, I'm praying for a job. I've, I'm telling you, I've seen people change their lives simply by service. Go volunteer. If you have reached a certain part in your life, in your career, where you feel stuck or at the end of a certain era in your life, let me tell you, the way you break forth into the next level is by going to serve. Hallelujah. Go and serve. Hallelujah. You know, another kind of investment, and this one is very important, invest in relationships. Invest in relationships. Let's read a few verse, verses. Let's read a few verses. Now, when we say relationships, we are saying invest in people. Now, this is both ways. Now, if you are somebody who is succeeding, look for young people and invest in them. Invest in young people. You know, it is always very strange when I see people 60 and above and maybe all their children, their biological children, have grown up and have left and have, you know, probably married to their own spouses. And these people are struggling alone. Invest in young people. Find some young people and invest in them. I was raised with that culture. Invest in people. At every time in my life, I'm investing in somebody's life. Invest in people. You know, a time will come where you will need these people. They will become your wealth. They will, they will become your wealth in the very near future. Now, it also means if you're at a lower place in life, invest in mentorship. As in pay. Invest your money. You know, some people say, I want to be mentored by so-and-so person, but they invest nothing. Look, if you have a mentor, this is a good time to go and celebrate them. This would be a good time to invest in them. This would be a good time to go and do something special for them. All right? Some people don't know that. Honor your mentors. Honor your leaders, your pastors. Go and honor them. Do something special. Let them know that their work matters. Invest in mentors. Invest in family. So, let's read a few verses. Go to... Ecclesiastes, just turn backward, chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 9. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm an investor. I'm an investor. I invest in giving. I invest in business. I invest in relationships. Hallelujah. Let's read from verse 9. He says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. You see, so he's saying two are better than one because they have a good reward. He didn't say because they have good company. He says because they have a good reward, a better reward. So if you invest in people, you increase the reward. One way to secure your future, to create a glorious future, is by investing in people. Make no mistakes. Go and invest in people. Verse 10, he says, For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. 
for he had not another to help him up. He says, woe to you if you fall and you have nobody to lift you up. Expand your network. Invest in people. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The next kind of investment, okay, invest in personal growth and development. You cannot secure a future if you're not investing in personal growth and development. Read books, invest in your mind, give yourself exposure. You see, one of the things that people struggle with is when you understand the way the, the, the human mind and body function, for example, you would see or realize that the mind is drawn to what it knows. The mind is drawn to what is habitual. So if you are raised in poverty, if you are raised in, in hurt and wounds, what will happen is that your body and your mind will always default towards poverty. So you must expose yourself to new things. Expose yourself to books, to knowledge. Expose yourself to, to training, to mentoring. Expose your mind by going to places. Something happens when you're able to invest in your mind. You see, the mind is so powerful that if, you, if you're not careful, you will become who you don't think you are. You know, there's probably somebody watching this right now and there's something in your mind and you're telling yourself, I can never become that thing. Listen, you have a dream in your mind. There's a desire in your mind, but yet there's a limiting belief that tells you you can never become that thing. You can become all that God says you are. Hallelujah. So invest in personal growth. Big time. Invest in personal growth and development. Skill development. The right habits. Build yourself. Amen. Now, Another thing you should invest in, I think this is the seed thing to invest in, will be invest in work. Now, I'm going to show you a few interesting verses. Invest in work. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs. We're going to read a number of verses from Proverbs. You know, Solomon said so many things. This is one of the books of the Bible that we have to study every year. Just refresh your bank of, you know, practical wisdom. Now, let's start with Proverbs chapter 6 chapter 6 go down to verse 9 praise the lord proverbs 6 from verse 9 this is what the bible says it says how long will thou sleep O sluggard O lazy man how long will you sleep how long will you sleep he says when will you arise from thy sleep? He says, you've been sleeping, you're lazy. When will you arise? Now, verse 10. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Verse 11. So shall thy poverty, your poverty. It means there's a poverty waiting for you to sleep, to come upon you. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. He says, poverty will come upon you like an armed robber. He says, just a little sleep. So if you're going to have a glorious future, you must invest in hard work. You must work. You must work. My father always said, the lazy man should not eat. You have to work. Look at, let's turn to chapter 12. Just turn over to chapter 12. We are going to read verse 11. He says, He that tills his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that follows vain passions, vain persons, is void of understanding. He that works shall be satisfied. He that works shall be satisfied. But the one who follows vain people, vain conversations, useless things, ha, <laughs> ha, he says, you know your fate. He says, you lack bread. Hallelujah. You're void of understanding. Go down to the same chapter, chapter 12. Let's read verse 24. 
He says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. He says, The one who is hardworking shall have dominion. The lazy one, he will always be dominated over. You cannot have a glorious future if you're lazy. You can't. I'll show you many verses. Um, chapter 14, let's read verse 23. Proverbs 14, verse 23. The Bible says, In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. He says, In all labor there is, pro there is profit. Don't be invested in cheap talk. Don't just be a talker. He says, work at it. In all labor, there is profit. See, work is honorable before the Lord. In all labor, there is profit. Remember, I said invest. And the one who invests is expecting a profit. Therefore, invest in work. He says, in all labor, there is profit. Lastly, and I think this will be the seventh, invest in kingdom business. Invest in kingdom business. Look, Matthew 6 verse 33, he says, But seek it first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Wow. Look, one way to secure your future is to seek it first the kingdom, is to be a promoter of kingdom business. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 3, the Bible says, They that turn many to righteousness shall shine. Invest in soul winning. He says, If you turn many to righteousness, you will shine like a star. You want to be a superstar? Learn to be a soul winner. Become a soul winner. Talk to people about the Lord Jesus. Invest in kingdom business. Hallelujah. So again, how to secure a glorious future? Point four, invest. So invest in giving. Invest in commerce or business. Invest in, you know, generous service. Invest in relationships. Invest in personal growth and development. Invest in work and invest in kingdom business. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm an investor in Jesus' mighty name. Next thing, produce. To secure a glorious future, you must produce. Now, to produce really means, let me, let me read the definition that I wrote down. The Holy Spirit gave me this definition and I want to read it to you. To produce means to engineer the making, management, multiplication, and distribution of resources. Can I say that again? To produce means to engineer the making, management, multiplication, and distribution of re resources. Therefore, when God says produce, he's not just talking about make or create. He's saying make, manage, multiply and distribute let's read a verse genesis chapter 1 verse 28 genesis this was the lord's command chapter 1 verse 28 the bible says and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful make and multiply you know right he says and replenish the earth spread everywhere distribute it so be fruitful and multiply and replenish and subdue and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth so again to produce means to engineer the making management multiplication and distribution of resources now, yes, what's very interesting about that definition. Now, production is most profitable, is most valuable at distribution. Therefore, whoever controls distribution really controls the bigger pie of the production process. So, for example, if I were to position myself anywhere so whether it's making managing multiplying or distribution the most lucrative part of the production process is distribution is bringing that which was made or produced or created to the hands of the consumers okay so 
rightly deliver that which was made to the consumers or in consumable form. You see, for example, let's take agriculture. There are so many African countries. Africa's, for example, produces over 80% of the world's cocoa. But that's all. They have stayed only at the making part. So they invest in agriculture and they are at the making part. Switzerland, for example, has positioned themselves at the distribution part. They don't make the cocoa, in other words, plant them through agriculture, but they process, so they manage. So management also means to process. It means to take the raw material and make it into something beautiful. Then multiplication and distribution, that's where they position themselves. So they, have, they make the world's best chocolates and they have all of the money or over 80% of the money in the whole process of chocolates. You see, so when God says produce, he's not just saying make something. He's saying make it, manage it, multiply it, and distribute it. When you understand this, it changes your mindset. So if you have a talent or a skill, God is not just saying make something. He says, I want you to understand how to make, how to manage, how to multiply, and how to distribute. You must understand the processes. He's saying bear fruit, but don't just bear fruit. Don't just bear fruit. Take fruit and process into fruit juice, into fruit salad. You see what I'm trying to say? He says, process the fruit. He says, then distribute it to people. Distribution. For example, the prophet comes to the woman and he says, go borrow vessels from your neighbors. She borrows the vessels. Now he says, keep pouring. The crew shall not run dry. So she's pouring from her jar into all the vessels so she has not just she had oil so you can assume that she's managing and multiplying at this level so management was the number of vessels she could bring right and all of that now think of multiplication as how many vessels she could pour into but you see distribution she still had to go sell she had to take the oil to the market for it to be valuable to her her life will still not change if she does not distribute that oil for, to consumers or for consumption. She will remain the same. If you don't know distribution, you will remain poor. If you don't know how to sell what you have, how to market what you have, how to take the raw material of talent and skill that God has given you, how to manage it. It means to build it, develop it, how to multiply it, okay, and how to distribute it. So don't stay at raw material. Never stay at raw material. In fact, if you were to position yourself somewhere, you'd rather find people who have a raw material or something produced and be the guy who distributes it. This is very practical. Okay? Now, look at a very um, practical case in scripture. When you look at the life of Jacob and Esau. Now, Isaac calls his son Esau, who is the firstborn son, and he says, Go and, you know, kill an, a wild animal and prepare my favorite meal. Okay? So, Esau is a hunter. In other words, he goes to the forest. The animals that are there are raw material. What does he do? He consumes raw material. He's like a nation that sells their cocoa beans. So, he kills the animal. He brings it. And that's all. In fact, it was so bad and horrible... Esau was so poor at management, so processing, that he came with the animal on his neck when he was hungry, but he was unable to process it into a meal. So bad that he sold his birthright. So Esau was poor at management. So he had the raw material. He had the animal. He knew how to trap them and catch them. You see, but he was poor at managing. He didn't know how to process. You see, but Jacob, on the other hand, was a shepherd. So it means when he finds the animal, he doesn't seek to kill it now and consume it now. He puts it in a, in a fold. The goal is to multiply it. He wants to rear so he can multiply it. You see, so Jacob understood management, right? He understood multiplication, how to increase the number of sheep. He knew how to process. He could take meat and create a meal. 
That's why he got the birthright. So many people say Jacob was a deceiver. But to be fair, Esau was really the deceiver because Esau had sold his birthright. But then there he was going to, to, to get the, the meal for his father and get what he had already sold by his words. Remember I told you last week, one of the ways you create a glorious future is with words. And Esau had said, of what good is it? You know what? Give me the food. He had killed his future with his own words. And because of that, you see, he was unable to manage. He was unable to process. He was unable to, 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 to multiply his gain. The animals he had trapped. And hence, he lost the blessing. The father said, you will always be under your brother's rule. You see that? So, Esau kills his capital. He consumes his raw material. Jacob multiplies his raw material. He processes his raw material into a meal. He multiplies it into more animals before he consumes. Jacob is an investor. Jacob understands production. You see, Jacob understands that to produce doesn't just mean to bring the animal. It means to bring the animal and be able to turn it into many other animals and be able to turn that animal into a meal. And if you can turn the animal into a meal, then you can receive the blessing. You can distribute it. You can quickly take it to the father. He got the blessing. Hallelujah. Let's read Proverbs 27. Just one verse there. I'm a producer. I produce. I make, I manage, I multiply, and I distribute. That's my mindset. Proverbs 27. Go down to verse 23. Hallelujah. Proverbs 27. I'll read from verse 23. He says, He says, Be thou diligent, to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. He says, you must know what you have. Be a good manager. He's talking about management here. Verse 24. For riches are not forever and doth the crown endure to every generation. He says, riches don't last forever. If you don't, if you just make money from the animal you went and killed and sold, it doesn't last forever. So for example, let's take a country that produces cocoa. If all you're doing is producing the cocoa and selling cocoa beans, what if one day your farm gets burned? He says, you must learn to produce to by not just having the cocoa beans, but transforming them, being a good manager, multiplying it and distributing it. There's, there's an example I always give, just a business example. Now, if you have a lady who says, I'm looking for business capital, then she gets a capital of maybe $20 million and she opens a poultry farm. Okay, she opens a, a poultry farm. She has over 15,000, you know, hens laying over 40,000 eggs daily. She has all this great infrastructure. She rests them and she has put in all of those $20 million there. And then there's this guy who goes to the city and becomes a friend with all the shopkeepers and all the store owners. They know him. So he comes to her, he buys the eggs from her, and he takes to the market. So he's in charge of distribution. You see, the problem with that is the market knows him, not her. So at any day, he can decide, I'm going to open my own poultry farm, and she's out of business. So yes, the Bible saying, it says, manage your flocks, for riches don't last forever. You see, look at that. Verse 25, the hay appears and the tender grass showed itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs, verse 26, are for thy clothing, and the goats are the, are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goats' milk enough for thy food, and for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance of thy maidens. So he says, don't just eat the goat. Don't just take the goat and kill. He says, milk the goat and have his milk. You see, so you see that's management. Because if you consume the goat, you have just taken what was made and you know lost it. But productivity or production or to produce. But to produce really means to make, to manage, 
to multiply and distribute. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm a producer. I produce in the name of Jesus. Lastly, Hallelujah. Are you learning something? Praise the Lord. Lastly, if you're going to have a glorious future, you must systemize. You must learn to build systems. Hallelujah. Now, there's an acronym that I always derive from the word system. And I always say system is save yourself stress, time, effort or energy and money. So whatever you design that helps you save yourself stress, time, effort or money. If you're going to have a glorious future, you must learn to systemize. You know, one of the biggest challenges of the average African home is that every generation is starting from a new, from zero. There are no systems to how wealth is transferred. There are no systems to how businesses are run. There are no systems to how our nations are run. Now, a system is simply a standard of doing things, a standard way of doing things. So um, I'll tell you, systems, for example, um, are the reason why God doesn't have to wake up every morning to make the sun arise. He has built something called the solar system. So the sun is in a system that causes it to rise every morning. And, you know, in the evening we see the moon. Does that make sense? So he built a system. That's why he, in our bodies, he put systems, a digestive system, a reproductive system. So when God says children are a blessing from God, it's because he took the idea of fruitfulness, of production, and put in a system called the reproductive system. If you apply this plus this, there's supposed to be a baby. If you want a glorious future, you need to know how to systemize. Praise the Lord. Now, systems make outcomes predictable. Systems will cause you to do the same thing the same way every time. You can be consistently excellent. I was talking with someone the other day and I said the problem with so many of our African meals is that there's no standard of measure of measurement so it is so difficult to have a meal cooked the same way three times because every time it's cooked something changes you add the salt just as the spirit leads you you slice things as the spirit leads you but when you look at the western world a lot of their meals are measured half a teaspoon of salt three cups of this you know you must systemize your cooking. Systemize the way you run your home. Systems make outcomes predictable. I always tell people that systems are stronger than anointings. Systems have cured more sick people. Hospitals have cured more sick people than healing evangelists. So while um, we, we cannot despise the ministry of the healing evangelist, we have to recognize that until you can build a system that gift to be lost. The future cannot experience that gift if you're not there. One of the miracles of our generation is that God will give us systems for productivity, systems of prosperity in the name of Jesus. Systems will make change easy. When there's a system, you predict the way things happen. Build systems. You want to prosper? Build systems. Right now, the way your life is run, if you were to step away and someone were to leave your life for you, how easy would it, be, would it be for them? How easy would it be for them? All right? So, systems reveal and upscale potential. They reveal and upscale potential. So, systems will take what you know and cause it to multiply. You see, when you look at systems, then you can go backwards. In terms of, when you look at systems, will cause you to produce and will cause your investment to yield and increase. You see what I'm trying to say? So systems are so powerful. 
think of systems in broad scale. When you build a system, you have to build a backup system and a backup of the backup system. You have to build monitoring systems. It means you have to monitor and evaluate. How is it going? How is it performing? You have to constantly stop to check how your life is going. If you have been living and you never have days where you stop to evaluate your life, to evaluate your productivity, there's a fundamental problem with you. So you need monitoring systems. You need reward systems. When something good happens, how do you reward yourself? You need discipline systems. Invest in a system, in a system that will cause you to grow spiritually. Sometimes you cannot just say, I'm going to pray every morning. You have to say, I'm going to pray every morning in so-and-so place. You have to attend church because that's a system. Certain relationships that you keep are a system. Accountability partners, mentoring, that's a system. Build a system. Build a particular way. Whenever you have a significant result in your life, sit down, study how you obtain that result and build a system. Systems are replicable. I, that's why when I look at Africa, there's no doubt that we struggle. There's no system to how African music is created a lot of times. But when you, you see, recently I saw this documentary of people in the West studying how African music is created. Studying African food, studying African, you see, because the people who invest in distribution are intentional about building systems. They need the customers or the consumers or the audiences to have the same level of excellence every time. And therefore they invest in systems. You cannot be a global shaker if you're not a systemic thinker. You have to be systemic. When do you wake up? When do you go to bed? What do you eat? At what time? You have to be systemic in your thinking. You see, when you learn to build systems, you can transfer a legacy. You can transfer. Great families have a way that they raise their sons, a way that they raise their daughters, activities that they must indulge in, places they must go, things they must say, ways they must dress. Those are systems. Systems will, will, will become an insurance for a glorious future. Look, if after doing all the things that you do, you speak the right words, you have the right vision, you follow the right people, you're an investor, you, you know, you're a producer. If you can do all of those things and you don't build systems, everything will be lost with you. Systems will facilitate transfer, transfer of wealth. Transfer of responsibility, transfer of ownership, you know, passing down a heritage. Systems facilitate these processes. Invest in systems. How do you run your home? How do you run your life? How is your office run? How is your work? How is your ministry run? Decide today that you are a systemic thinker in the name of Jesus. I'm a systemic thinker. I build systems and they cause me to prosper. In everything I do, I build systems in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, I'm a systemic thinker. I build systems in everything that I do. I decree and I declare for you right now that your future is glorious. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, declares the Lord. You see, God is a systemic thinker. He has many plans for you. If one fails, the next one shows up. Hallelujah. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you an expected end. Hallelujah. Plans to give you a glorious life. In the name of Jesus, I decree over you that your end is glorious. The Bible says the latter shall be greater than the former. You see, your end is glorious. Your future is bright. I decree and I declare over you that as you sit down with these points and learn to put them into practice, I declare that your future is bright. I declare that you leave a legacy. I declare that the teaching of this series and this word will not just fall on deaf ears, but you will sit down and put them to work in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for you right now that your mind will get to work in, way, in, in ways that you can't imagine. Your mind will get to work. 
in how you can be an investor, how you can be a producer, and how you can be a systemic thinker, a system builder in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. And I pray that as you put this to work, your life will never be the same again. I decree that you will see the hand of God upon you and your future is glorious. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. If you watch this to the end, you know, remember, like, comment, subscribe. If you're not subscribed to our channel, turn on the notification bell so you never miss. And don't forget, share it to all your friends. Share it to all your friends. Share it to your family members, to the people that you work with. Let them learn how to build a future, a glorious future. And see you next week. We're going to be starting a new series, a new teaching. See you next week. And God bless you. Amen.